Michael, you, you did such a good job, I almost don't need to tell my own story, but, but let, me, let me do it anyways. <clears throat> um, so you, you can hear my accent. It's uh, an American accent. And when you hear this, this accent, um, it, it's, you wonder how, how in the world did, did this American guy end up in such a mess that he just described. And um, let, me, let me tell you how it all started and how it all unfolded. So, um, as Michael mentioned, my grandfather, Earl, was a, um, uh, a trade union activist in Wichita, Kansas. And um, he was so good at, at, um, at organizing the trade unions that in, in uh, 1927, the Russians said, if you like trade unionism, you're going to love communism. Why don't you come to Moscow? So... Earl Browder, my grandfather, went to Moscow. And um, <clears throat> he did what a, what a lot of young American men do in Moscow. He met a Russian girl um, who became my grandmother. And my father was born in Moscow. And then uh, he had, had done so well inside the Communist Party that they sent him back to America in 1932. And Earl Browder became the general secretary of the American Communist Party for the next 15 years. My, my grandfather ran for president twice on the communist ticket in 36 and 40 against Roosevelt. Um, he was then imprisoned uh, for being a communist in 1941. And then he was expelled from the Communist Party in 1945 for being too capitalist. <laughs> but that didn't help him five years later um, when McCarthy came around. It didn't matter whether you were a good communist or a bad communist, you were still a communist. And then he was then persecuted and... Um, had to sit in front of the House Subcommittee on Un-American Activities for many months on end, testifying about his communist, act, communist role. So this is my family legacy. Um, I was born in 1964, and when I was going through my teenage rebellion in the 1970s, um, as I was rebelling against my family, I said to myself, what's the best way to rebel against a family of communists? Well, the, um, I figured it out. I put on a suit and tie and became a capitalist. There was nothing I could do that would upset my family more than that. I went to um, Stanford Business School, um, and I graduated in 1989, which was the year that the Berlin Wall came down. And most people in business school, the purpose of going to business school is to get your first job out of business school. And, um, and so as I was trying to figure out what first job should I get, None of the jobs that were on offer in business school appealed to me. And as I was searching my soul for the right job and the right career, I had an epiphany, which was, if my grandfather was the biggest communist in America, I'm going to go become the biggest capitalist in Eastern Europe. And that's what I set out to do. So fast forward um, a few years. Russia, um, Boris Yeltsin, so the Soviet Union um, had split apart Boris Yeltsin becomes the head, and he says, I want, to be, I, I want to make this country no longer communist. I want this country to be a capitalist country. And so he came up with this interesting idea, which was to make a capitalist country, you can't just declare yourself capitalist. You actually have to make people property owners. And so they, they embarked on something called the mass privatization program, where they were going to give away all the state property to the people for free, and then everyone would have an interest in capitalism, or so he thought. Well, as you all know, it didn't turn out quite the way it had been planned. Instead of the whole country getting all the assets, 22 oligarchs ended up with 40% of the country, and the rest of the people in Russia lived in poverty. But there were still crumbs falling off the tables. And um, the crumbs that I discovered falling off the table was the, um, the crumbs of, of shares of Russian companies. You could buy shares of companies like Luke Oil, the big oil company, or Gazprom, or the electricity company. Um, and, and I did the math back then, and you could buy these shares at a 99.7% discount to the value of shares in the West. And um, nobody, interestingly, um, nobody else did this math, and I, and I don't know exactly why, but um, I did this math, and I, and I figured that... that um, uh, sure, there, it was a risky place. Sure, it was a terrible place. Sure, it was a corrupt place. But if you're buying um, at a 99.7% discount, um, there's really not that much further down it can go. Um, and if for some reason 
it goes, it, Russia doesn't disintegrate into nothing, and maybe it goes, it goes from horrible, which is what, what it was then, to very bad, then it goes to, let's say, a 90% discount, and you can make many multiples on your money. And so on, on the basis of this simple analysis, which I've just shared with you, I, I set up an investment fund called the Hermitage Fund to invest in, in the Russian stock market. And um, we started buying shares in 1990. I moved to Moscow in 1996. We started buying shares. And my fund grew from almost nothing um, to eventually becoming the largest investment fund in Russia with $4.5 billion of assets under management. And so I actually succeeded in this goal of mine to becoming the largest capitalist of some sort in Russia. Now, this was all very exciting and good to be managing all this money. Um, but as I, as I got to know the country, I realized that these companies that I was investing in, they weren't, I might have owned shares of the companies, but I didn't really own a share of anything because the um, uh, oligarchs, the majority shareholders of these companies, um, were stealing all the money for themselves. Even if they owned 50% of the company, they would steal 100% of the profits and then the assets and then some. And so I was sitting there with a big responsibility um, managing all these other people's money, and there was all this stealing going on right in front of my face, and the stealing was really, really brazen. Um, there, was a, there was a case where um, we discovered that Gazprom, the, the, the big gas company, that the management of Gazprom, um, nine guys between 1996 and 1999, had sto stolen oil and gas reserves the size of Kuwait off the balance sheet of Gazprom. I'm not exaggerating. We, we did the analysis. <clears throat> I could show you the size of Kuwait. Now, the other thing we discovered about Gazprom is that the... Um, uh, the, the size of Kuwait only represented 9% 9, 9 of, of the reserves of Gazprom, and so 90% of the stuff was still on the balance sheet. In any case, um, what we decided to do with all this stealing was um, uh, I, I couldn't go to the police and say, can you arrest these people for stealing because the Russian police were not uh, honest. And I couldn't go to the politicians and say, um, how can you allow this to happen because the politicians were in on the action in a small way. And so I came up with this idea of doing what's, what's, what we coined the word stealing analysis um, of how they went about doing the stealing. And, and that was something that was in my power and my ability to do. And, um, and then I could share the stealing analysis um, with the international media. And there were lots of journalists in Moscow that loved me because I could save them three months worth of work by sharing with them my stealing analysis. And so we, we started this process of, of doing this research, publicizing it, and then seeing what would happen. And amazingly, when we publicized the stealing, what would happen was that um, uh, the government would wake up and step in after the scandal broke, and the president or the government would then cancel or, or in some, fire someone or, or in some way stop the stealing. And so as a result of this naming and shaming campaign, um, we were able to, I wouldn't say eliminate the stealing, the stealing still went on, but we were able to curtail some of the stealing, and the value of my shares went up quite considerably. And so I really had the, the, um, the perfect job. Um, I, could, I was making money for my clients, making money for myself, and getting the bad guys, and, and I would say um, improving Russia. Now you may ask yourself, how is it that... that um, that exposing corruption in Russia stopped any stealing, aren't, aren't, aren't they just all corrupt? And, and the answer is that when I started doing this, I had a strange alignment of interests with none other than Vladimir Putin. Vladimir Putin had come to power in, as a prime minister in 1999, and he became president in year 2000. And he had the same set of enemies as me. The Russian oligarchs were stealing power from him at the same time, they were stealing money from me. So when he came to power, the one thing he wanted to do was, was to stop them from stealing his power. And so every time I would publicize one of these scandals, he would step in. And as a result, um, I lived this charmed life for about four years. But it was really too good to be true. In 
late 2003, as I was um, running on my treadmill in my, in my uh, study at home, I, I was watching CNN, and I saw that um, uh, Mikhail Hordakovsky, the owner of Yukos, the richest man in Russia, had been arrested. And um, he had been arrested, and, and we all thought that, that a rich guy, he, he'd have, they'd have to let him out of jail after a day or two because rich guys never stay in jail. There must be some kind of, he didn't pay a big enough bribe or something. But after a day or two, he was still in jail, and after a week or two, he was still in jail, and after a month or two, he was still in jail. And then Putin put him on trial in June of 2004, and, and, they, they allowed, and Putin allowed, and did something which was unusual. They allowed the television cameras to come into the courtroom to film the richest man in Russia sitting in a cage. And this, was a very, this had a very powerful psychological effect on the other rich guys in Russia. Imagine that you're the 17th richest oligarch in Russia, and you're on your yacht parked off the Hotel du Cap in Antibes, and you come out of your, your bedroom and you flick on the television station on the CNN and you see the richest man in Russia sitting in a cage. What's your natural reaction going to be? Well, <clears throat> not to sit in a cage. And so one by one by one, the oligarchs went back to Putin at, this, at the end of the summer of 2004 and said, Vladimir Vladimirovich, what do we have to do to make sure we don't sit in a cage? And he said, very simple, two words, 50%. Not 50% to the Russian government or 50% to the presidential administration of Russia, 50% to Vladimir Putin. Now, I wasn't witnessing these meetings. It could have been 30%, could have been 70%. But what I can say for sure is that after that summer, the oligarchs became Putin's business partners and Putin was no longer fighting with them, that he was treating them much, much more favorably. And I hadn't read the tea leaves properly, and so instead of um, uh, seeing how the, the tides had changed, I was carrying on with my naming and shaming campaigns. And um, as I was flying back to Moscow in November of 2005, after a business, after a weekend trip to London, um, I was coming to Sheremetyevo 2 airport. I went to the VIP lounge, uh, what should have been a five-minute um, ordeal getting my, um, or a five-minute exercise getting my passport stamped, turned into a 45-minute situation. And then four guards entered the VIP lounge, grabbed me, and escorted me down to the detention center of the airport. They locked me up. They kept me there for 15 hours. And then they frog-marched me onto a plane to go back to London and deported me from Russia. Several days later, um, we received a, a formal notification from the Foreign Ministry of Russia that I'd been declared a threat to national security. When the Russians turn on you, they don't do so mildly. They turn on you with extreme prejudice. And I knew that, that this wasn't the end of my troubles. This was the beginning of my troubles. And I said to myself, what do I have to do to protect myself from the Russian authorities. And there were two things that I had <clears throat> that they could have taken. One was they could have arrested my people, and the second is they could have seized my assets. And so I evacuated my staff as quickly as I could, and then I sold all the securities that we held in Russia so they couldn't seize them or take them away. And once I was finished getting my people out and getting the money out, I dusted off my hands and I said to myself, Phew, there's nothing more they can do. That was, uh, that was scary, but, but I'm out. Got everyone out, got the money out. I'm finished with Russia. It turned out that maybe I was finished with Russia, but Russia was just getting started with me. 18 months later, 25 police officers raid my office in Moscow. I kept an office there in case this, this story ever changed. I had one secretary, that was all. 25 more officers raided the office of an American law firm that I used. And they were specifically looking for the stamp seals and certificates for the investment holding companies through which I had invested my money in Russia. They seized those documents. And then the next thing we know, 
We no longer own our investment holding companies. They had been fraudulently transferred out of our name into the name of a man who had been convicted of murder and let out of jail early by the Interior Ministry. At this point, I became very concerned. There was no money at risk because we got our money out, but the fact that the police were involved in this highly complex financial scam worried me tremendously, and we went out and hired a bunch of lawyers, including a young man named Sergei Magnitsky. Sergei at the time was 35 years old, and he was the cleverest lawyer in Moscow. And I thought to myself, I need somebody smart who can help me figure this out. And he went and did the research to figure out what they were up to. And he came back with two um, conclusions of what they were trying to do. The first was that they were trying to steal my assets. But as I just mentioned to you, we got all of our money out, and so they didn't succeed in that. But the second thing that Sergei figured out was the most cynical thing that he had ever seen which was that um, it, when, when we were liquidating all of our assets, we had a, a large profit, and we paid $230 million of taxes in the previous year. And what Sergei discovered was that this group of corrupt police officers went back to the tax authorities in December of 2007, on the 23rd of December of 2007 to be exact, and applied for a $230 million tax refund from, our from the government to our stolen companies. It was the largest tax refund in the history of Russia. They applied for it on the 23rd of December, two days before Christmas, and it was awarded the next day, no questions asked. The largest tax refund in the history of Russia paid out on Christmas Eve. We were certain this must be a rogue operation. How can Vladimir Putin allow, I mean, sure, he can steal from foreigners, but how can he allow this to happen to his own country's money. It wasn't my money that was stolen. It was the Russian government's money. And so we decided that if it was a rogue operation, we should expose it. And we wrote criminal complaints to every different branch of Russian law enforcement, and we publicized what had happened. And we expected the good guys to get the bad guys, and that would be the end of the story. Well, it turned out that there were no good guys. Instead of opening a criminal case against the bad guys, the police opened criminal cases against all of our lawyers. And at this point, we had seven lawyers working for us from four different law firms, including Sergei Magnitsky. As soon as they opened these criminal cases, I became, I, was, I became terrified for my lawyers, and I asked every one of them to leave Russia, come to London at my expense, stay in London at my expense to get out of harm's way. It wasn't an easy conversation to have with any of them, and, um, and it took a while, but six of the seven lawyers left Russia. The only one who wouldn't leave was Sergei. Sergei was about 10 years younger than the rest of the lawyers. He wasn't fully um, conscious of the evil of the Soviet era. And he had this, what I would describe as stubborn idealism. He said, I've not done anything wrong. There's no law. I've not broken the law. I can stay here and the law will protect me. And so he stayed. And not only did he just stay, but he went and testified against the police officers involved in this scam. He testified against them in October of 2008, and one month later, on the 24th of November 2008, the same officers he testified against came to his home at 8 in the morning in front of his wife and two children, arrested him, put him in pretrial detention, and then began to torture him to get him to withdraw his testimony. They put him in cells with 14 inmates in eight beds and left the lights on 24 hours a day. They put him in cells with no heat, no window panes in December in Moscow, so he nearly froze to death. They put him in cells with no toilet, just a hole in the floor where the sewage would bubble up. They moved him from cell to cell to cell in the middle of the night. And the purpose of all this um, mistreatment was to try to get him to withdraw his testimony and then to sign a false confession to say that he stole the $230 million and he did so at my instruction. And none of us know how we would behave under such pressure. I don't know how I would behave I don't think Sergei knew how he would behave in advance. I don't think any of you would know how you'd behave when put under that kind of pressure. But amazingly, um, for Sergei, the idea of perjuring himself and bearing false witness was more poisonous and more painful than the idea of the terrible pressure that they were putting him under. And he refused. He refused, and the, the conditions just get kept, kept on getting worse and worse and worse for him. He ended up losing 20 kilos developing severe pains in his stomach, 
and, uh, and he was diagnosed as having pancreatitis and gallstones and needing an operation. On the 1st of August, 2009, he was supposed to have an operation, but instead of operating on him, they came to him again with this, this Faustian bargain of signing this false confession. And Sergei again refused. And so instead of operating on him, they abruptly moved him from a prison that had medical facilities to a prison called Butyrka, which is a maximum security prison, um, one of the toughest and most awful prisons in Russia, and most significantly for Sergei, a prison without any proper medical facilities. And at Butyrka, his health completely broke down. He went into constant agonizing pain, needing medical treatment, and they refused. They consistently refused all of his requests for medical treatment. He, he applied in writing, he and his lawyer applied in writing on 20 different occasions for medical treatment to 20 different, to 20 different recipients. Every single one of his requests was either ignored or rejected. Finally, his, his body could no longer take it, and on the night of November 16, 2009, he went into critical condition. On that night, the prison authorities at Butyrka decided to move him back to a prison that had the medical center called Matroshka Tishina. They put him in an ambulance to go to Matroshka Tishina, but when the ambulance arrived there, instead of putting him in the emergency room, the guards put him in an isolation cell, they chained him to a bed, and then eight riot guards with rubber batons came in and beat him to death that night. He was 37 years old. He left a wife and two children. I got this news the next morning. At 7.30 in the morning on the 17th of November 2009, my phone rang, and it was my Russian lawyer, another Russian lawyer calling to tell me that Sergei Magnitsky had been killed. And it's, it's indescribable, the physical pain that I felt from Sergei's death. Sergei wouldn't have been killed if he hadn't been my lawyer. He had been taken hostage and tortured to death because he was my lawyer. And it was the most heartbreaking experience I've ever had in my life. And I made a vow on that morning, then and there, that I wasn't going to let the people who killed Sergei Magnitsky get away with it. And the, 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 this case was unusual in one very serious respect, in that Sergei Magnitsky had documented everything that happened to him. He wrote 450 complaints in his 358 days in detention, telling what had happened to him, all the abuse, who did what to him, when, how, where, and why. And we had copies of every one of those complaints. And even though the Russians never acted on them, um, they allowed them to be filed, and because they were filed, they were the, the, uh, effectively official testimony from the grave of what happened to Sergei Magnitsky. This became the most well-documented human rights abuse case that came out of Russia in the last 35 years. And we expected, because it was so well-documented, that the people who killed Sergei Magnitsky, no matter how corrupt Russia was, would have to face justice. They'd have to throw a few of their own guys under the bus. But they decided instead to circle the wagons completely and absolutely and exonerate every single person involved and some of the most complicit were given special state honors and promotions. There were only two people ever prosecuted in this story. Sergei Magnitsky himself, three years after he died, in the first ever trial against a dead man in the history of Russia, and me as his co-defendant. In July of 2013, they held the trial. It was a, a multi-month trial with prosecutors, defense attorneys, judges, guards, the only, the only people that weren't there were the defendants. One was dead and one was in England. And they found us both guilty. I was sentenced to nine years in absentia. Throughout this whole process, it became clear to me that if we weren't going to get justice in Russia, then we're going to get justice outside of Russia. And we weren't going to get the, these people for torture and murder because there's no jurisdiction for torture and murder outside of Russia. However, the people who did this crime did it for money. They did it to steal $230 million. And so we said to ourselves, those people don't like to keep their money in Russia. They like to keep it in the West where it's safe. They like to travel to the West where they can go on vacation. They like to send their kids to private school in the West. And so I went to Washington. And I went to a number of senators in Washington. And I told them the story, the same story I've just told you. 
And I said, how about we take away these people's visas and freeze their assets? And there's not many things that people in Washington could agree on, but this was one of the few things they could. And I ended up getting a senator named Benjamin Cardin, who's a Democrat from Maryland, and another senator who you've all heard of, Senator John McCain, a Republican from Arizona, to jointly sponsor the Sergei Magnitsky Act. And the Sergei Magnitsky Act first started out with just just to go after Sergei's killers and sanction them. But when it was launched, so many other victims of human rights abuse in Russia came forward and went to these senators and said, you found the Achilles heel of the Putin regime. This is what they care about. Their money is in the West. And as a result of that, these senators realized that they're onto something much bigger than just one case, that they found a tool, the modern-day tool, to deal with this terrible stuff going on in Russia. And so they added 65 words to the law to say that they weren't just going to sanction Sergei's killers, but they're going to sanction all other gross human rights abusers in Russia. And it quickly started to snowball. And in November of 2012, it went for a vote in the Senate, and the Senate passed it 92 to 4. It went for a vote in the House of Representatives. It passed 89%. And President Obama, who at the time had been trying to appease Russia with something called the reset policy, was forced, based on the Constitution of America, because there was no way he could veto this, to sign the Sergei Magnitsky law, or act into law. And there are now 34 people on the Sergei Magnitsky list who have been sanctioned. On the, they're on the federal OFAC sanctions list, which means that they can't open a bank account anywhere in the world and have their assets frozen in America. And this just absolutely terrified Putin. And... Um, uh, as a result of, of and, and the reason it terrified Putin is even if the 35 guys, 34 guys on the list are not um, uh, uh, that high level, he understands that this can be used against him. And guess what happened? When, after the invasion of Crimea, they used the same exact tool on all of his people. And this is now the, the, uh, one of the main tools that we can use other than go to war with Russia to hit them where it counts. Um, so to finish off, one, one of the... Um, so we've passed this law, and the law is part of my, what I call my political thread or prong to this campaign. We also have a criminal justice prong to this campaign, which is going after the, the, getting the law enforcement agencies of, of different countries to freeze and seize the assets of the bad guys who have, the, who have that money, have that $230 million, going specifically after the $230 million. We've actually been investigating it for five years and have found out where about 200 of the 230 has gone. And so far, the Swiss prosecutors have frozen about $20 million. The U.S. prosecutors have frozen $15 million. And there's a bunch of other criminal cases going on as we speak. And this really upsets the, the bad guys. And then the third prong of this whole thing is telling the story. And I, I, at first, I thought I could just tell the story through the newspapers and I would, I would get people to pay attention. And, um, and, I, and I realized after working with a lot of journalists that um, even if I'm fortunate enough to get their attention and they write a story, not that many people read the papers. And of the people who read the papers, oftentimes they don't read the article that I worked so hard on getting into the papers. And if they did, they probably spent about 45 seconds on it. And I thought to myself, if I could get people for a really long time to tell the story, then I might be able to really move them in terms of understanding what's going on in Russia and how horrible it all is. And so I said to myself, if I can write a book, I get people for 10 hours. And now, you get them for 10 hours sometimes, but not always. I, and, and I know from my own personal experience, I've got 20 books stacked next to my bed that I've read 30 pages of, and then I stop. And I said to myself, if I'm going to write this book, I don't want my book to be one of those books that, that people only read 30 pages of. And so I killed myself writing this book to make sure that everybody read this book to the end. And I can absolutely guarantee you that if you read the first 10 pages of this book, you will read this book to the end. It grabs you by the scruff of your neck, and you will read it to the end. And you'll be moved by this book. Um, you'll be entertained, you'll be angered, and you'll be moved. And, um, and so, th so this is my sort of intermediate step in my campaign for justice. And the final step is that um, is when I finish this, this uh, book tour, is we start working on the Hollywood movie. Now, I can't tell you who's going to play me, but, um, but, but
but if I'm if but this movie will get made in the same way as this law got passed, and and 20 million people will hear this story and will be able to tell all their friends about it, and and hopefully that will change people's opinion of what's going on in Russia. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Bill Browder, for summarizing more or less uh, your wonderful book, which reads like a John le Carré spy novel, and it's even more horrible because it's real life. It's, it's, uh, you must have been lucky that you're still here, because uh, you, you, in the book you wrote uh, that probably you're on a hit list of the Kremlin. Have, have you been afraid? Well, so... <clears throat> There's, there's two, two answers to that question. The, um, the first answer is, am I on a hit list? And the answer is yes. Um, I've been threatened with death threats, with kidnapping threats, um, with extradition threats, with Interpol red notices, um, with lawsuits, defamation, etc. cetera. And, and that I have to deal with. Um, but am I afraid? I, I don't live my life in fear um, because... Uh, Sergei didn't live his life in fear. Sergei did a, was much braver from prison still fighting about this than I could ever be, and I owe it to him to make sure that I'm looking forward and trying to figure out how to get these guys than cowering in fear. Have you ever been, when you started to live in, in Moscow in the 1990s, and it was, it, were, it was a sort of wild west at the time, did you ever... Uh, noticed all those power struggles on the streets, all those mafia clans uh, uh, beating each other up, all those police forces from several districts fighting against each other in the evenings. How, how was it at the time? So, so Russia has had two, two different phases of criminality. So when I went to Russia in the 1990s, it was, it was the end of a totalitarian regime, and there was chaos. And to, to fill the vacuum of the chaos was criminality. But the criminality was what I call disorganized criminality. It was, it was random street violence. It was, it was guys with leather jackets and gold chains showing up in fur, fur stores to try to shake down the owners. And it was avoidable criminality and chaos if you just kept your head down um, because it was, it, was not, it was disorganized. And I, it never touched me in any way. What happened when Putin came into power is it became organized criminality. Putin became the biggest criminal. But what was your opinion of Putin in the first few years of his reign? Well, so Putin came in after Yeltsin and after the chaos. And so I, I and, and I should point out that everybody in Russia at, at the end of, of 1999 was in a state of, of moral exhaustion because 22 oligarchs had basically taken away the whole country from the people. Uh, nurses had to become prostitutes. Professor, eminent professors had to become taxi drivers. Art museums were selling the um, uh, paintings off the wall. The whole society had basically disintegrated because all the money had been put into yachts and, and villas. And so everybody was desperate for some type of an order to be restored. And in comes this, this inscrutable little man, Vladimir Putin, saying that he's going to get rid of the oligarch and bring, oligarchs and bring some normality back to Russia. And, and I was cheering very loudly, and so was everybody else. And anyone who says they weren't cheering when he came in is lying because um, we were all hoping that, that the oligarch era would end and it would come, turn into a normal country again. And for a few years, it kind of was. I mean, Putin wasn't all that comfortable in his own skin, and, and he, he still felt accountable to the people at that point in time because he hadn't sort of established his dictatorship. But eventually, as I said, he got Hordakovsky out of the picture. He became the biggest oligarch. Um, and at that point, instead of um, having 22 oligarchs, there was only one oligarch. And, and it's much worse, actually, now than it was back in the 1990s. And what did you think about uh, Mikhail Khodorkovsky at the time, in 2003? In 2003, he was one of the bad guys. And there's no question that he was a bad guy. And he changed uh, during prison. Well, I mean, he certainly paid his debts to society. And, um, and, and it, I've met Khodorkovsky recently mm. in... in and we, um, we both agreed that whatever disagreements we had in, in, in the early days fighting over money were, were far less significant than the, than the agreement we have today about how Russia is 
going down the tubes. And so I, I forgive him, and I, I, um, um, will, I will work with him uh, to, to try to find an end to this terrible situation in Russia. Mm -hmm. you, you, you write in your book that um, how easy it was to, to make huge profits in stock exchanges. Maybe you should tell something more. Your first experience was at a cons as a consultant of Salomon Brothers London at the Moormans Trawler Company, where the management want, uh, was able to buy 51% of uh, the stocks for two and a half million dollar. So, what, what did you conclude after your research at the company? So, so, so my, 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 first, my first business in Russia, I went to Murmansk, which is located 200 miles north of the Arctic Circle, um, to advise the management of this fishing fleet because they had an opportunity to participate in their private, the privatization of the fishing fleet. And um, they took me on a tour of the, um, of the fleet and the, the general director said, I asked him, how many boats do you have? And he said, we have 100. And I said, how much do each, does, does each one of these boats cost? And he said, $20 million. So I did the math. 100 times 20 million gets you to 2 billion. I said, how old are the ships? He said, on average, about six to seven years. I'm not a ship expert, but I thought, okay, maybe that means they're about half depreciated. So a billion dollars worth of ships. And then I asked the general director, and how much is it going to cost you to buy 51%? And he said, two and a half million dollars. So didn't they realize at all what capitalism was about? Because even I could have made this sum well, and become the, the, rich. The, you should have. Yes. <laughs> well, I, 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 so they, were, they, they bought the 51%. I said, yes, you should buy the mm -hmm. 51%. I was just an advisor, but I thought to myself, I want to get in on the action here. This is ridiculous. And so instead of going back to London, I went to Moscow, and I went and did the research, and I discovered something else they had going on, which was called the uh, voucher privatization program. And the voucher privatization program was even more interesting than this one. They, they gave away a voucher to each person in Russia in 1992. So they gave away 150 million vouchers. And the vouchers then were, were, they were like a dollar bill. They were freely tradable. And they traded for about $20 each. So if you do the math, 150 million times 20 gets you to $3 billion worth of vouchers. And these $3 billion worth of vouchers were exchangeable for 30% of the shares of all Russian companies, which meant that the entire value of Russia was $10 billion. This is a country with 10% of the world's oil, 30% of the world's natural gas, 10% of the world's oil, uh, steel and aluminum, all for $10 billion. I mean, it, it was just a, literally a giveaway. And so that was when I, I said, we, you know, they're, they're, it's just, it's free money. I'm never going to leave, you thought. Well, I said, I want to buy this stuff. I went back to Solomon Brothers, where I worked at the time. I said, we should be buying some of this stuff. And the moment I mentioned Russia, people didn't get to the point where I was doing the, the math about the valuation. They just shut right down. And so um, uh, I almost lost my job for suggesting to invest in Russia. And afterwards, when you started your own company in Moscow, uh, you had uh, a fight with one of the oligarchs, Potanin, a fight which you, probably because of your brave character, you actually won. What, what happened afterwards? Because people were thinking you were, you, you were having protection of Vladimir Putin at the time. So my, my first fight was with an oligarch, which I, I, I with Vladimir Potanin, over a, um, uh, he was trying to steal $87 million from us through a, a dilutive share issue. And we started to publicize it. We, um, um, we, ma we made it into an international scandal. And, and strangely, we, we won this fight. And, um, and then Putin came into power after that. And Putin started to, um, and, we, and then we started to do these naming and shaming campaigns. And everybody said to themselves, how is it that this guy from Chicago is doing this stuff? This just doesn't make any sense. And, and in Russia, Everything is a conspiracy theory. Nothing, nothing is as it, as it seems on the surface. Nobody believes the first, the, the simplest explanation. Everybody thinks it's a conspiracy. So they said, okay, there's this guy from Chicago. That doesn't make any sense. Therefore, who's behind him? And then they saw Putin stepping in after I would expose all these oligarchs. They said, that's very clever, that Vladimir Putin coming up with this guy from Chicago to, um, to do these exposés. And so the, the conventional wisdom for four years was that somehow this, I was a Putin project, that, I was, um, that Putin was uh, uh, 
behind me. And so nobody touched me for four years thinking that. And, and I, I've never met Putin in my life, but I wasn't going to disabuse people of this notion because it kept me alive. So that were the years in which you make your biggest uh, profits. Yes. And that, that, does it work because from time to time you read in, in, in an English newspaper like the Financial Times that Norwegian or German businessmen really have got this protection of Putin? Does it really work like that, that nobody dares to touch you? No. Um, there, there's a couple people that have the protection of Putin. Uh, Gerhard Schroeder, um, who is the, chancellor, the former chancellor of Germany, um, has the protection of Putin for doing his bidding in the West and a few others. But basically, when, when people come to me, I, I get a lot of investors coming to me and saying, um, uh, you know, should I invest in Russia? Is it safe to invest in Russia? People tell me if I stay out of strategic industries, I can invest in Russia, et cetera. People all have different ideas about how they might be able to get by in Russia. And, and the only way that you can get by in Russia is to make sure that you never make any money in Russia. Mm -hmm. Anytime you make any money, they're going to come after you for your money. And the worst thing about it all is that, is that the, um, there, there's, if you're a Westerner, there's only two options. You can either become part of the corruption in Russia, you can become sort of effectively part of a criminal enterprise, in which case you break the laws of the West, or um, you can do what I did, which was um, defy the corruption in Russia, and then you've effectively broken the informal laws of Russia, and they, then they'll kick you out, seize your assets, and put your people in jail and kill you. And so there's no good, there's no good outcome. But in the beginning, and, and you also write about it, you were convinced that, that a healthy economy and a healthy state needs transparency and openness. It does. And, and, and you tried to realize it. It does, I did, and it, and it failed. And, um, and I often get people, I, I, there's, there's a case study about this at Harvard Business School about my, my story. And, uh, I go, and I go to Harvard every year or two. Um, the, the, the professor presents the case study, and I sit in the audience for a little while, and they all say what they're going to do if they were me. And then, and then at the end, uh, for about 45 minutes, I come out and tell what really happened. And, then every, and it's the one class at Harvard where, um, where um, the students cry, one case study at Harvard where the students cry. And, um, uh, uh, and, then, and then afterwards, I always get these kids coming up to me from Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan and so on and say, you know, I really want to, you, you inspire me. Should I go back to Kazakhstan and try to, like, improve things? And I say, no. You actually can't. You, know, you go to New York. Um, don't go to Kazakhstan because you, you, you either become part of the system or you defy it and you go to jail. It just doesn't, there's, no, there's no way around that. Mm -hmm. you, you, you actually, you, you unveiled with, with your, uh, your actions, with the YouTube videos you posted about the whole system of uh, uh, tax inspectors, uh, public prosecutors, police officers. You unveiled a whole system which is actually the basis of Putin's rule. Is it ever possible? Do you think it's, it's, it's possible to change it? Or do we have to accept it as long as the junta, nowadays junta, is in power? Because we know it's a very group, small group of people, maybe four or five, who are really dictating uh, 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 politics there. Um, P Putin is a criminal. He's a criminal involved in massive crimes, involved in this particular case of a cover-up of a murder. Um, uh, while Putin is in power, it's going to be terrible. There's, there's no, there's no, you can't moderate his behavior. Can Russia change? I think that Russia, um, Russia is absolutely changeable. Um, in, in my own opinion, there's 140 million uh, decent Russians, hardworking, honest people, and there's a million really bad ones, and the million bad ones have occupied the country. But it doesn't mean that, that the country is unchangeable. What it does mean is that, that while this man is in power, Nothing good is going to happen. Mm -hmm. And also that, that those 140 million don't want to rise against uh, uh, their rulers because they think, okay, when, when Putin has left, there will be another bunch of thieves in power. So, so the, the sort of science of revolution is, is not very scientific, but, but it comes down to, to two variables. One is how angry people are and how bad their country is versus how scared they are of being repressed, imprisoned, or killed for going up against their country. And the Russians, people say the Russians are docile. The Russians are not docile. They're just more scared than other people because it's just a more brutal regime than other places. And propaganda is nowadays at its highlight. Yeah. So it's probably very difficult to, to change the attitude. 
Well, I, I, for ordinary I, Russians nowadays. I, I don't think that's true. I mean, if you look at these sy systems in North Africa, Tunisia and Egypt, you know, they, they lasted for a very long a time until one moment it all fractured. Mm -hmm. And it all fractured based on economics. Why, why did Tunisia and, and Egypt fall? was because we were in this world of, of inflation of food, food prices and oil prices, and people were living at subsistence levels, and finally they, they just couldn't, they couldn't afford not to uprise. Mm -hmm. And, and we're, we're entering into a, system like that, a situation like that in Russia right now, where the economics have gone disastrously worse because of falling oil prices and because of sanctions. And it may very well be, and none, I don't think any of us can predict it, and I don't think Putin can predict it. I think he's sitting there terrified of what might happen because of the people's personal economic situation. Can, can you imagine uh, the, the regime in the Kremlin um, is not interested at all in its own people? So do the sanctions work? The, 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 the ordinary people suffer, but actually the regime doesn't mind at all. Well, so... so what, what is the function of the sanctions? Well, so, so sanctions, the European Union wants to has sanctions in place, and I've, I've actually spoken to officials to talk about this at great length, they have sanctions in place in their own mind to uh, alter the behavior of Putin, to bring him to the negotiating table, which is a stupid reason to have sanctions because Putin is unalter his behavior is unalterable. However, sanctions are very good for one very, very simple reason, which is that Putin is out there invading foreign countries right now. And what sanctions do, very simply, is it gives him less resources to go in, and, and embark on these dangerous, aggressive murderous exercises. And so sanctions will not change Putin. Sanctions will hurt the Russian people. Um, but sanctions will take away his ability, his money. Um, and he's got to make choices about what bad things he wants to do because he just doesn't have enough money to do all the bad things he wants to do. Mm -hmm. it, it has been told that actually the Russian army hasn't got the power or the money to start an occupation of, uh, of, of, of eastern Ukraine. Do you believe that? No, I, I think that, that they could easily occupy eastern Ukraine, and they will occupy eastern Ukraine, and, and, we're, we're, and, and we're, we're not that far away from you know, a full-scale military invasion. Mm -hmm. And, all, all these, the, and I, I wouldn't believe a word of any of these um, ceasefires. The ceasefires are purely tactical moves. This most recent ceasefire was a tactical move to delay the arming of, of Ukraine by the EU and by the United States for three months. What do you think the West should do? arm Ukraine with lethal weapons? So it's very simple. And, and people, people say, you know, if we arm Ukraine, it will enrage the Russians and they'll do bad things. Well, the Russians have been enraged by themselves without us doing anything. Um, the, the Russians will eventually take Ukraine, and then they'll take Moldova and Georgia and then go to the Baltics. And so the, the only question is, when do we want to start fighting with the Russians? Because we're going to eventually going to have to start fighting with the Russians. No, no, oh, later on maybe. Because then the, the, the audience can, can ask its, its questions. It's now my time. <laughs> How long will it take? Okay, I allow it. How long will it take, the Russians? How long will it take to... To, to occupy the whole of... He can't understand you, so... Come up to the microphone. So, so come up to the microphone. Yeah, yeah. My, did I understand you well? That you said uh, Russia might uh, take whole Ukraine, Moldavia and the uh, Baltic states? Did you, yeah? Yes. Well, what... How would it be in Europe then? I'm very yes. worrying about war. Okay. So, so let, 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 let's, just yeah. go, so, so let, let's just go through the logic. Yeah. The, um, He's a mathematician, so... So the logic, is, the logic is very simple. First of all, let me explain to you why Putin is there. Putin is not there because NATO provoked him. Putin is not there because of some historic ties to Crimea. Putin is there because he's a kleptocrat. He was, get, he was able to steal a lot of money and then he got scared because a neighboring kleptocrat, Viktor Yanukovych, was run out of the country by his own people, and he couldn't allow himself to get run out of Russia by his own people. And Putin knows that wars tend to distract the, the population. And so they invaded Ukraine for one simple reason, which was to distract the Russian population and to run a, ma a massive propaganda exercise at the same time to convince the Russians 
that Ukrainians were Nazi fascists that were going to ethnically cleanse their, their, their Russian speakers in eastern Ukraine. And so he convinced them of that, and he invaded, and his approval ratings went to 88%. So now he can't back down. Because if he backs down, everyone's going to say, what about those ethnically cleansing, the, the, the Nazis ethnically cleansing our people? Someone else will come to power. So he's got to keep on going. So he, he's going into Ukraine. The problem is he can't stop anywhere. He's got to keep on pushing. And his, the real prize for Putin, and he's a very clever man, is he wants to destroy the credibility of NATO. So he's going to invade the same way he invaded Crimea. He's going to do the same thing with Estonia or Latvia. They're not going to send troops in full columns into Estonia and Latvia. They're going to send people across the border, little green men. And then, then the West, we in the West are going to have to make a choice. Do we want to go to war with Russia for countries that most people in America, anyways, haven't, haven't even heard of? And Barack Obama, he's, he's not a big red line man. He's the Peace Prize president. And so Putin is sitting there. He's doing his calculation. He says, I've got 18 months. I've got 18 months before Obama leaves office to go and, and, and ha force this choice on him. And the choice is not going to be easy because there's not going to be official Russian troops there. There are going to be fake Russian troops there. And so then the question is, do we want to go to war with Russia? And, and I don't know the answer, but I, but I suspect maybe not. And if that happens, that we don't go to war with Russia to protect NATO members, then NATO no longer exists. And then all of a sudden, Poland is up for grabs. And you, you, you may think this sounds crazy. People thought it sounds, sounded crazy to that, that Russia would invade Ukraine. They are there. 5,000 troops have died. I completely agree with this point of view. Well, what, 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 what do you think the West actually should do in the, in the most in the most serious way, because we know that all these Western governments, they know what it's about. I spoke to a Dutch diplomat at dinner, and he told me, we're not going to arm uh, Ukraine. We, we are afraid of escalation. We have got huge business interests in, in, in Russia. I think assets 500 uh, uh, billion in the oil industry, of course. Germany is at the second place as an investment. Maybe we should invite Peter Omzicht, Member of Parliament uh, for the CDR, to take part in this discussion? Because maybe he can answer this question. Another, why the Dutch government is so, so we, we grab afraid chair? of making clear choices? Let, let me just introduce Peter Omzicht. Peter um, Omzicht played a very important role uh, 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 during the Magnitsky Act. Okay. Peter is my, my um, partner who we stood arm in arm um, fighting the indifference over the Magnitsky case in the um, Dutch Parliament and in the, in the Council of Europe. And he was the one who initiated a major investigation into the murder of Sergei Magnitsky in the Council of Europe, which ended up in a massive condemnation of Russia written by the Council of Europe. And, and I'm very honored to be having him join us here tonight. Good to see you in there. Yes, thanks. Peter, please. Please tell me, why didn't the Dutch government uh, uh, accept this Magnitsky Act? Because Bill has been here for several times to, to convince uh, members of parliament of the importance of this act. Are we afraid because of our business interests? We're extremely afraid. And by the way, you're all bothered about Magnitsky. I would be even more worried about why we don't do anything after the MH17 downing. That killed about 200 people. Actually, many Americans and, and uh, scientists, professors, uh, uh, criminologists who recently visited Amsterdam, they, they told uh, that they can't understand why the Dutch people are so are not talking about it anymore. It's no, it's no uh, a matter of discussion anymore in Parliament. From time to time, something, a little article appears in the newspaper, but actually the politicians are not talking about it. Is it because uh, the Dutch are leading in this, uh, in this investigation? Well, quite frankly, I've, I've been asking more plenary debates. I have not had a single plenary debate on the downing of MH17. In the meantime, we've had three plenary debates on the um, 
um, on the quality of the meat of horses, which is hardly ever eaten in the Netherlands. Um, it, it looks like uh, Dutch politicians, but that's more general in Europe, are not able to think anymore in power politics. So you get into this whole system of human rights and state democracy, and we think that other people in the world think exactly like we do, and they don't. And that's a big mistake we're making with the Middle East. There's still people, it was still in debate today with a politician from another party who thought that we should negotiate with IS. And um, the same happened with Russia. We think that if we talk nicely to them and if we explain it and if we explain it again and maybe explain it the third time, they might understand what we want. And that's a sort of negation of history. And that's what's, what, what's going on at the moment. So what we need to do is to learn to play power politics again. And if you don't do that, if you don't play, you get played with. And I'd will, rather play. Do you think it will change when uh, the Christian Democrats uh, uh, will get in power? No, uh, not immediately, no. Because you're a no. of your position, so it's very easy to criticize uh, the Rutte cabinet. Oh, that's always easy. Always, but he, always he makes it extremely easy, that I have to admit. <laughs> that, that point I'll get, give you. No, it's, it's deep into our genes of how we play politics at the moment. That's exactly what happened with MH17. It's very interesting that Franz Timmermans flew to New York. He should have flown to Moscow two days afterwards. He should have gone to Putin and said, now you give me the evidence of whatever weapons you had over there. And whatever you that would have put public pressure. And he could only have done it in the first week after the disaster. He can't do it now. Mm -hmm. And that's what's happening when we're playing power politics. And the same is happening with Magnitsky. It's even worse in the Council of Europe. So in the Council of Europe, we had this long investigation. At the end, we decided, hey, the Russians have done this wrong. Let me tell you, we first started asking questions. Sabine Leuthauser Starenberg, who's the former Minister of Interior of Justice in uh, Germany, she first started asking questions when Mr. Magnitsky was still in jail. The Council of Ministers refused to answer. He first had to die. Is this happening again? Yes. I asked questions half a year ago, Ms. Savchenko, who's a Ukrainian fighter pilot, who's been captured by the Russians. Captured by the Russians? Yes, she's, she was captured in eastern Ukraine, and then she voluntarily entered Russia, and then there she was picked up by the Russians, so the Russians say. Quite an unbelievable story. The Russians uh, do force us not to uh, not to give answers, not to, not to play straight. And to tell you even worse, I last year pleaded for sanctions against Russia within the Council of Europe. Now the Council of Europe has no teeth, so the sanction is to take away their voting rights and to take away the rights that they can be there. They were extremely surprised, and when my proposal actually was accepted, they walked out and were not seen for half a year. So then they came back in January, because you have to renew these sanctions, that's the way the statutes work, don't worry. So in January I said, well, we took sanctions because of Crimea, and in the meantime, they've invaded eastern Ukraine, uh, they've shelled people. If anything, the invasion of Crimea was quite peaceful. I mean, one person was killed in the end, and it was a bit of shoving and stopping, but it was nothing. From everything that was going on, it wasn't military a big thing. The eastern Ukraine is a military a big thing. Thousands of people died, not only people in the M817. There was almost a majority who didn't want to put any sanctions on Russia because they wanted to talk to Russia. Look, listen, if you're going to have that kind of behavior, you'll end up giving away everything. And that's what's happening with the EU at the moment. They don't know where their vital interests are. Let's see it uh, a bit more uh, international. In the, the British House of Lords bill, uh, last week uh, uh, an investigation, a, a report was published in which the Lords acknowledged that they were sleepwalking more or less into a confrontation with, uh, uh, with Moscow. How come that, it, that this happens now? Because the British are sending troops, training uh, officers to Ukraine, 75 uh, uh, personnel. It, of course, it's a symbol. But what changed in British Parliament? Well, let me start out by saying that <clears throat> um, the, the, when, right after the invasion of Crimea, you know, uh, 
there is a, a guy walking into 10 Downing Street, one of the advisors from the foreign office, foreign, uh, and, and the photographer caught, yeah. caught him on, got a picture of his, of his memo. And, and, and this sums up everything. The memo said, let's talk tough, but do absolutely nothing. Because all those rich Russians living in London. Right, and, and so wh man. why? Because basically the Britain has got all this money flowing in from these Russian oligarchs who all buy houses and, and employ concierges and, and have drivers and, and manicurists and hairstylists. And nobody wants that to dry up. And so as a result, they're basically Britain and, and BP. And so basically as a result of the real estate agents and, and manicurists and oil men of, of Russia, um, Britain has to sacrifice the uh, strategic security of, of Europe. And, and the, the, the British also, t together with the Americans in 1994, they signed the Budapest Memorandum, oh, this, in which they assured the sovereignty of the Ukrainian borders this is, this, in exchange for the, for the nuclear uh, uh, rockets. This is really good. This, this is really good. So, so, so they finally so, feel so, responsible. So, 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 these guys, so, so, Britain, so Ukraine had a bunch of nuclear warheads at the end of the Soviet Union. Um, uh, John Major and George Bush went to Yeltsin and Kuchma, who was the president of Ukraine at the time, and they signed a, a treaty called the Budapest Treaty, which said, the Ukrainians said, we'll give up our nuclear warheads as long as you protect our territorial integrity. Every, they signed a treaty. And then all of a sudden, 20 some odd years, years later, the, um, Russia invades Ukraine. And what did the Americans say about the treaty? They say, well, it wasn't really a treaty, it was a memorandum of understanding. This is what they said. I, 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 I was there. I was there with Madeleine Albright and, and, and um, Condoleezza Rice, who both were justifying it, saying, this is a memorandum of understanding. Well, what's a memorandum? And so, so I mean, nothing matters. And, 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 and Putin is watching this and laughing because he knows that the NATO treaty is a memorandum of understanding. Well, we're now talking about Ukraine, but I think we should take one step before. What happened is we got into war with Russia and Syria before we got into war with Russia in Ukraine. Russia is supporting the Assad regime. Uh, the US has been thinking and then training and then not training and then training and then not training the opposition. The opposition they officially trained has disappeared. So it's, the West has shown lots of signs of weaknesses in the sense of what sense it, what it wants to reach. And um, it's given also some excuses. I mean, it did not very intelligent things in invading Libya, for instance, which in the end means that we, we gave lots of signals over the last three to four years to Putin that we don't know what we're doing ourselves with NATO. And that's, he's exploited that to a big degree. Um, I'm slightly less, um, I think, that in the end we should have a deal with Putin if you really look what our strategic interest is, then we might actually have more to fear within the Middle East at the moment than we might have to fear from Putin. Oh, I think it's the other way around. I think the Middle East problems are more or less the Hofstadt group in the desert and uh, Russia really can start a nuclear war in the center of Europe. Putin is up to it. Putin is up to it, definitely. When he really feels that he is going to lose, he can launch a nuclear missile. Yes, but I, he, he could. The whole thing about Putin is, um, if he were to invade all the countries you were mentioning, I think he, made, he may overstretch himself. The Russians are strong, but are not that strong in that they're capable of having a war at multiple fronts. They still have too long a border, too many difficult spots, be it from North Korea to Ukraine, to do everything. He's crazy enough that he can do it, but he wouldn't be able to sustain it. But the damage that could be done in the process, which you described, is enormous. Uh, aren't, aren't we mistaken when we, when we say that Putin is uh, crazy enough? Because uh, uh, I think actually that, that Putin is a very rational man. He exactly knows what he's doing. He's, of course, he's standing with his back uh, uh, to the wall because of uh, the chaos which uh, he started himself in eastern Ukraine. But I don't think he is crazy. He is very rational thinking what he can do. They, they, they are more or less making some new strategies. Of course they are not going to invade the Baltic countries, but they can do more or less the same as they are doing in eastern Ukraine.
Ukraine in, in Latvia and Estonia, and they already started it more or less. In Estonia, they already had one incident, yes. Um, and even the Russians uh, in Estonia, the, 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 the Russian nationals in Estonia, they really there was there were some military uh, maneuvers the last few days, and, and Dutch soldiers took part in, in it. And uh, the Russian population said it's a provocation of Putin, and they really became angry. Yeah, no, but it's very difficult. To so it's easy to start a new conflict over there. Bill, Bill, what do you think? Well, I, I, I think that that. Um, uh, I, I used to um, go to the White House. A friend of mine was the um, president's national security advisor on Russia in the White House. He became the, the ambassador eventually to Russia. And uh, I used to go to him and I would have these conversations with him about Russia. And he was saying, Bill, you, you need to understand that we need Russia to deal with Iran. And I, I said, you just mark my words. In 10 years from now, um, we're going we're to be having the same conversation and we're going to need Iran to help us with Russia. Um, what should we give Putin to, to, to put no. him at ease? The, 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 no, you, you, no. You giving is... The, is the he, he, only understand, he only understands force. Yeah. Right now, he, he's, he's encountering no resistance whatsoever. And, and the reason he is encountering no resistance is because in the West, we, we've had 50 years of peace. We have a bunch of soft leaders who have never dealt yeah. in a wartime situation. And sometimes you have to threaten war to have peace. And Putin understands that as long as nobody is ready to step up to the plate, with the exception of the Ukrainians, um, uh, that, that he can continue pushing and, and provoking everywhere. And so the, the one thing we can do, which is a pretty low-level thing to do, is if the Ukrainians are ready to, to lose lives of their soldiers, we should at least give them weapons so they can keep the Russians busy over there so they're not busy invading other places. Do you think Ukraine has got a chance to become, in 10 years' time, a normal European country? I, th I think Ukraine already is, is going to be a frozen conflict um, for, for, for a long time. Which will deteriorate. It, it may be everything. a frozen conflict or it may be, it may be, an un it may be a hot conflict. If, I, only I, it were become, if only it were a frozen conflict, right. it would mm -hmm. probably so, now settle for it. You know, so, the, the, the one thing I, want, I, I just want to say one thing, which is that everybody is talking about avoiding a Cold War. If, if you listen to the rhetoric of, of, of European politicians, they say, we want to avoid a Cold War. In, in my opinion, a Cold War is the best possible outcome. We're never going to be able to go back to the status quo. So there's only two options, a hot war or a Cold War. And a Cold War is basically a situation where they're not moving forward and we're not moving forward and everybody is, is stuck in the, in the same position. Peter? Yes, and we should be able to win that one because remember in the, first, in the last Cold War, the border was we still had on the Russian side. We had Ukraine, we had... Hungary, we had Poland, we had Romania. All of them are now on the Western side. So the resources are still in, Western, in, in, in the West and Middle Europe. So we should be able, this should be an easy thing to do. But I agree completely that without any show of force, we will lose, we will lose out. Because that's, that's the whole thing we, we, we constantly say. Do you want anything more, Mr. Putin? It's like saying to my daughter, do you want any more sweets? I know the answer, even if she's completely sick, she'll say yes. And, and that's, but that's, that's how we're behaving. We think that we're negotiating like, you, like we're negotiating here, or we're negotiating in Dutch politics between coalition partners, that's the way we're negotiating with Russia, and we need a different style of negotiation. Because there's no win-win situation with the Russians. There may be win-win situations, but you only have to, the problem is, the they will always take it and then start from negotiating from there. Um, yes. And that, look, listen, uh, we already have the first atlases which have already colored Crimea in the color of Russia. We've yes. given it away completely. I'm pretty sure that if Russia tomorrow comes up and says we'll give back Eastern Ukraine, no one will start about Crimea. Okay. No one. So, and that's from they start moving, and they start moving that border every. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I'd now like to give the microphone to the audience. Um, you in front. I'd just like to ask you about financial sanctions because, um, for example, in the case you were telling us about when you started talking to U.S. legislators about freezing the assets of certain Russians in the United States, don't they just move their money to Singapore or Hong Kong or something like that? They, they absolutely do. Um, 
But, but financial sanctions have, have, have several. So if, if you put somebody on the US OFAC sanctions list, that's the list that, that everybody goes on, um, it doesn't just, it, so it, let's say they move their money. Um, th there, there's actually no place they can move their money to because no bank in the world wants to bank with somebody on that list because no bank wants to be in violation of US sanctions. And so uh, you, those of you in the world of finance might, might hear, have remember the story of what happened to the French bank BNP. They, they, they were doing, out of their Swiss branch, they did business with Sudan in Iran. And the only thing that had anything to do with America is that they were doing dollar transfers. And so it went through for one second the American banking system. And as a result of that, they were, they were fined $8.8 .8 billion by the U.S. Treasury. And so what happens to anybody on the sanctions list is they get completely shut down everywhere in the world. No bank will touch them. And so basically, you know, you may not be able to grab their, their money, but it makes them into financial pariahs that nobody wants to do anything, have any business with. And it's not, it's not the be-all and end-all of justice and so on, but it does, it, it's, very, it's very powerful and something they absolutely hate. They hate it with all their heart. The U.S. Is the, the on, the US is the only country that has extremely extraterritorial laws. Its laws, it manages to apply them all over the world, which we can't. Thank you very much. I wonder if we could say something about the domestic opposition in Russia, such as it is, because you've painted a certain portrait and given us a few scenarios, but the fact of the matter is the Russian economy is based largely on oil and gas. We've seen the price go down. You have the sanctions that you've talked about. Crimea is also costing a lot of money. So isn't there another scenario that maybe something could happen internally? Well, the, the answer is yes, nobody knows for sure. So, so, what is, so Putin is, is a very clever guy. He, he's a very scared guy and a very clever guy. And he doesn't want to um, have anybody overthrow him. And so what he's done is he's identified anybody who's a potential competitor and put them in jail. And so anybody who, who has been, so the, the, Russia had these great opposition rallies in 2012 when Putin switched seats with Medvedev and hundreds of thousands of people went out into the streets of Moscow and St. Petersburg and other places. And Putin very cleverly got the um, video surveillance, figured out who was leading the opposition, and then just arrested everybody involved. And so, if there w so you're right that, that with economics, with, with the ruble crashing by 50%, with oil prices down, with reserves running out, with military expenditures going up, Russia will bankrupt itself in, in the next couple years unless oil prices rise or unless Europe free sanctions. Um, but nobody has any, any roadmap to how the op domestic opposition might formulate itself to oppose Putin. And, and he understands th this risk, and so uh, whatever, whatever means they took to, to repress the opposition before, you can imagine that they're going to take ten times the amount of effort now to, to keep this thing in check. Will it work? Will it not? Nobody knows. You know, I remember Iran, when, when they had this green revolution, it looked like it was all going to work, and then they, they successfully repressed it. No, nobody knows. Putin could last two months. He could last 25 years. He doesn't know. We don't know. Daar in het midden. Komt naar voren, alstublieft. Hello. Hi, Bill. Um, uh, my question really is, the, the, the reason why you're sitting here today, what's brought you in front of all of us, is the debt that you feel you owe Sergei Magnitsky. And you've been traveling the world uh, in an effort to get justice for Sergei, get laws passed which are blacklisting people who you feel were involved in his, uh, in his death. What for you, specifically, would constitute the best outcome? In other words, what for you would constitute actual justice for Sergei? What has to happen? Thank you. It's, it's pretty straightforward. Um, the people who tortured and killed him are prosecuted in a court of law in Russia and found guilty and put in prison for their crimes. That's the only justice. Anything that I'm doing up until, uh, up until then is a stopgap intermediate measure. Um, and and um, it makes me sleep a little bit easier at night knowing that the people who, who are who did this to him aren't enjoying absolute impunity, that they're, that they're, they're bearing a cost, that they're, they're upset, that their lives are complicated. Um, but I, but in, in, and I, I believe that, at, that when the Putin regime falls, and coming back to the previous question, if it happens in two months or two years, then, then the tribunals 
of the crimes of the previous regime will be the Magnitsky tribunals. I, I believe that they'll be the first tribunals because this case has, be has become notorious. This is like the Steve Biko case in, in, in apartheid South Africa. This is, this is the, the most emblematic case. Um, and that, that's the only thing that's going to bring me true, true calm uh, after this whole thing is over. Do I think that, that, that the regime will fall and that we'll get that justice? Yes, I do. I, I really do. I think that, that Putin, we, you know, everyone asks me how long, what's the probability? I don't know how long and what's the probability of Putin losing power. But what I do know is that whatever the probability was before, it's gone up a lot since, since this military adventure because the economics have cr crashed so spectacularly. Meneer, het uh, beige truitje. <laughs> Thank you very much for being here, sir. Um, what I would like to ask you, on the one hand, there's the travel restriction for the, for the various people out of Russia, but yet we have these oil company CEOs flying directly to Mr. Putin traveling in um, and still keeping, keeping his operation going to a certain extent. Is there anything we can do about that, sir? Right, have you any ideas on that? The oil companies basically oh, yes, providing yeah. the funding still for these oh, yeah, operations. Yes, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Well, the, 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 the sanctions that have currently been put in place on Russia um, as a result of the um, actions in eastern Ukraine, are, there, there are what's called sectoral sanctions. And those sanctions are quite severe. And those sanctions um, forbid Russia um, or what the Western... Western Finance, financial organizations from, from lending for longer than three months to a variety of Russian companies, including Rosneft, one of the big oil companies. And on top of that, there are sanctions that forbid Western companies from providing technology for the oil business. And so um, we can't prevent Bob Dudley from going over there, but, but um, for all intents and purposes, there's not a whole lot he can do um, over there at the moment to assist the Russians in their, in their actions. Mevrouw, nogmaals. Sorry. Ik wilde. Oh, thank you. Uh, you said uh, Putin might be out of destabilization de uh, NATO. Did I understand well? I, I didn't, didn't hear you. Exactly. Oh, that Put you, did I understand you well that you said Putin is out of, uh, wants to destabilize yes. the NATO? Yes. How do you see the world would like, look like when that would happen? I, I think very bad, but how do you see it? It's a very um, scary, yes. scary thought. So, so the purpose of NATO, Na for, for those, those of you who don't know, NATO is the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, which means that a number of countries, most civilized countries in Europe, have an obligation to one another for mutual protection if somebody invades or, or, or challenges their borders. And what this does, in principle, this combined with the European Union um, keeps us all at peace. If either the European Union were to fracture or the North Atlantic Treaty Organization were to fracture, then all of a sudden it's every man for himself. And then people start making all sorts of decisions. And it may be that people don't even have troubles with each other but end up having to align themselves with Russia because that's the least worst opportunity. And you'll end up in a situation where, you know, Poland will be exposed. If, if, if Poland, and then, you know, I'm always amazed. I was just in Germany I'm um, doing the same, same talks two days ago, and the Germans are absolutely against providing military equipment to the Ukrainians. And I'm thinking to myself, why would the Germans be against it when the U.S. are for it? Germany is going to be the, 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 the front line at some point. It's absurd. Why not let the Ukrainians fight the Russians for a while before the Germans have to? Um, yeah, yeah, but this, is, this is this change of uh, power leadership, which has to be transited, I think. Yeah. Peter, maybe y y y you can comment on it. Um, um, <laughs> you don't have to. Well, I, I find it hard to think um, what to add to that uh, comment. Um, but we do see that um, countries like Finland and Sweden now want to join NATO. Um, because it's the only way of shielding themselves, especially Finland is um, having that internal discussion. Um, but the NATO, as long as it keeps its commitment, and that's that an attack on one of its members is uh, considered as an, a collective attack, and that, that means collective defense, 
then we have to um, provide help to that nation. Sorry? Do we have war in Europe? Then we'll have war in Europe. Well, right. well for the first countries that are exposed are the countries that are outside of NATO. So you already see that in the voting behavior and the strategic behavior of Armenia and Azerbaijan and a number of other countries, they will already look at Moscow because they're strict, they're dependent on Moscow. And that's the process Bill's describing here. Then we have two more countries, Georgia and Moldav Moldova, which want to join NATO, but we don't let them join NATO because part of their territories, Transnistria in the case of uh, Moldova and South Ossetia and Abkhazia in the case of Georgia, are occupied by sort of satellite states of, of Russia. And that means that those countries are the next to be exposed, and that's the process you want to stop. Those are relatively small countries. Now the same thing is happening to Ukraine. And um, so Ukraine will be extremely dependent both by gas and for its security situation in Russia, and therefore looks to Russia. And that's the process you want to stop by making sure that when they touch any NATO country, that that's the line you draw. If you let any NATO country fall, then the whole system of NATO, of collective defense, is dead. And that's very dangerous. That's also why we are protecting Turkey at the moment. Oké, okay. ik wil nu graag mevrouw met de rode trui het woord geven. Want anders krijg, u kunt de afloop nog altijd uh, een van ons aanschieten. Mevrouw, zegt u het maar. Niet te laat. Uh, good evening. Um, I immigrated from the Netherlands to Canada about 33 years ago. And I'm here for the week. I think it's terrible what goes on in Russia, but when I walk here in the street and read newspapers, I hear hate imams are coming. People are looking to me like just like that. I've never seen it before. How, why cannot they not clean up this country themselves? And then you think you have to clean up in the borders there somewhere in the Ukraine, Europe has to clean up themselves first. Why can't they do that? I think this is a question for a completely different forum. <laughs> no, I mean, I'm, I'm if, seriously, I find it very saddening. Society changed, ma'am. I know, mm. but this, there are two mm. dangers in my eyes. You want me? Well. Yeah. The, 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 that is indeed a discussion by itself, but a discussion by itself is that um, part of us not knowing our value system anymore is not defending our internal value system within our own European countries. And I'm deeply worried about that. I and I can talk to you about that for years, but that's because he's got a Russian wife, my wife is from the Middle East and Christian, so you know pretty well what at the moment um, she came here as a refugee. And um, I can tell you the most horrific stories about what's happening there with prosecution in Iraq and Syria on a daily basis. Do you want to know anything more of that? Then the guest I have next Tuesday is the Patriarch of Damascus. And then you come, come to the Parliament okay. and listen to him what's happening with prosecution I'm there. But it's a completely enough, different story. I'm lucky enough I left story. the Netherlands already. I'm really happy. It's a pity. <laughs> it's a pity. It's a pity. <laughs> I don't get anything more much. there. Meneer. <laughs> Thank you. I'd like to talk about the financial ties between uh, Western Europe and Eastern Europe. And we are in a very weird dilemma, and I don't think we get out of it. Um, step by step, very slowly, we are increasing the sanctions on, on Russia, whether it's very strong or not, whatever we think about it. There are huge, huge invested interests from many companies, from many banks. Take the Raiffeisen Bank, for example, in, in, in Austria, to, just to mention one. Of course, many German, big German companies, Siemens, just mention them. And as a matter of fact, in the same page, I read the interview with you. There are some people who do read the interviews with you, don't worry. And on the same page, it said that, it might have been, might have been even in your interview, I'm not too sure, that the huge, let's say, Dutch companies, of course, Shell by all, by all means, uh, Philips, AXA, okay, we can mention Unilever, should simply uh, um, write off all their assets in Russia. They should forget about all the investments they made there because they will be soon, or not so soon, whatever, worthless. Now, we take this into consideration, and we look on one side at the long story of whatever you call it, terror in, in, in Russia. We should not forget that Stalin killed 
perhaps between 30 and 50 million of his compatriots, of all the Russian people. So this is a part of the history of Russia. And we look at the weakness of politicians in Europe. Fortunately, there are a few exceptions to the rule as well tonight, but most of them are very weak. So what the hell should we do? I mean, this is the dilemma. No, it, there was, a, it was an idea to cut off the swift uh, connection between the financial system of uh, the United States and the, uh, and, the, uh, and the Russian banks, which would m imply that they would collapse more or less the same day, which could be a good idea. But with all those interests which are contradictory, where the hell do we go? Sometimes you have to stand for your own values. And if you're never prepared to do that, and if you let your king drink beer without knowing what you talk about, just to mention one example. Lose it. And that's what we're doing it. If every single time we're asking ourselves whether it could hurt us a little bit, yes, it will hurt us. It will hurt us the same way as we still have parties in parliament today. You may not think that a joint strike fighter is the right one to buy, but if you think we do not need any aircraft, which you heard in Parliament today, and we don't need any ships, and then will somehow be defended by I don't know whom, you're in an illusionary politics. And yes, if I'm buying those expensive planes, which are way too expensive and not well designed and whatever, I can spend less money on healthcare. Let's face it. And I'm still doing it as our insurance policy. I'm not pretending it's free. And the same way with business. Sometimes you have to take a decision, you're doing business or you're not doing business, and it may hurt. And by the way, if you think you can do business freely, and if you want to listen to Shell, you should always ask a Shell executive whether they still remember the Suckling Islands. They lost billions. They were simply taken away by the Russian regime. Mm -hmm. So if you give away everything and if you never say no, they'll take it away anyway. Actually, I agree. So we are 70 years after the war now. And basically what you said, we have to return to our values or not. That's what it is, right? Thank you very Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Good evening. Yeah, yeah. Good evening. Um, I... Um, I have a different analysis of um, Putin's motivation for his uh, politics, and I'm curious what you think about that. Because um, I think um, it's very important to realize that Ukraine, um, in the eyes of Russians and in the eyes of Putin especially, has, has, always, has never ceased uh, to be part of Russia. Uh, and as it is um, um, ethnically and uh, culturally very much Russian. Um, and I think it's important to note that, um, for example, Crimea um, in summer is, has been always very Russian. Uh, so um, the, my point is, I'm coming to my point, my point is that um, uh, I, I agree with your analysis that Putin was very uh, afraid uh, when Yanukovych was um, um, yeah, disposed of. Uh, so, of course, and that's probably the reason why, of course, he, wants to, he, he, he went to war with Ukraine, although not officially, because, he, of course, he wants to distract his people. But then I really do not agree that he um, wants to um, uh, take other former Soviet countries. For example, Georgia. He could have done so in 2008. He didn't. Um, oh, this is my analysis, and it's very different. So let me please conclude. Give me two minutes. I think my, my analysis is quite substantial. Uh, yeah. Uh, and I think really it's important to see that you, that, that Ukraine is being perceived as a loss of Russian soil, though it might sound strange, whereas the Baltics and Moldavia and Georgia are really, really a different case. And I'm, like, I'm interested in what you think about this. Bill. 
First, first, I'd like to comment that before this conflict started, 97% of the Ukrainian popul population did feel itself Ukrainian citizens, Ukrainian nationals. And it was only Russia which set up two populations which were broader peoples for hundreds of years against each other. You should not forget that. Of course, yes. <laughs> oh, this is of Bill. course true. Bill, I, I, <clears throat> you know, there, there is um, uh, there's a lot of uh, places that different countries had some connections to. You could say that California was part of Mexico. Um, you could say that Alaska was part of Russia. Uh, I, I support the Ukrainian cause. This is not my point. My point is that, uh, that we should be less afraid of Putin taking the other countries and or being against NATO that aggressively because I hear a lot of aggressive rhetoric and I'm only trying to sort of... So only time will tell, but yeah, um, sure. it, it all depends on your analysis. And, and your analysis is not that different from the analysis of the um, uh, Washington uh, status quo, which is that this is somehow about Ukraine, that, that, that it can be negotiated based on NATO, based on Ukraine. And, and if, if, if you're correct, maybe it can be, but I don't believe it can be. And, and I believe that anyone who's trying to negotiate about Ukraine doesn't understand that this is driven not by Ukraine. And this is a fundamental point. If you think it's driven by some, some version of Ukraine, um, then, then it can be negotiated. But I don't believe that. And I think that um, time will prove that Putin is doing this not because of Ukraine, but because of his fear of being overthrown and, and need, need to be in a war. And, um, and, and you can even see... Okay, okay, thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, Bill Browder has got to fetch his last bus home. Uh, this is the end there's one, there's one more of question. a very... Let's let, 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 let the last man ask his question. And okay. Then, and, then we'll, and, then we'll and this will be the last <laughs> question. Huh? For Bill Browder, there are currently there are two popular metaphors during the rounds about Vladimir Putin's psyche. And I wonder which one you would uh, adhere to, or maybe you think they're both simplifications. One is that he's a chess player. I think that's uh, Radovan Skorsky and, and Applebaum. And the other is that he is a judas. Uh, I don't even know the word in English, judoka. The, the sport that he actually is very good in, he has a black belt. Um, being a metaphor for being a very long-term planner and an opportunist. Uh, you seem to say he stumbled into Crimea, basically because of the uh, Yanukovych exit. And uh, but do you credit him with now a lot of uh, a lot of strategic planning? So, um, I, I, how about a third metaphor? Um, Putin is a poker player. He's got a hand. He, he's playing with a hand of twos, and he's bluffing the hell out of the West with a pair of twos. Um, that, that's what he's doing right now. It's, um, and he's doing, everything he's doing is tactical, not strategic. I don't believe he's a chess player. He's sort of a checkers player, if, if there was ever. And he's doing it very, very opportunistically. And he's able to do it opportunistically because he doesn't have any people he's accountable to. There's no parliament he's accountable to. There's no press he's accountable to. He can make decisions on the spur of the moment, rolling over in bed at night. And, and it's, it played well for him. You know, this, this game he played with, with Obama on the red line in Syria was just a major coup, sort of catching Obama off guard because he could do that very quickly and various things like that. And he thought he was doing the same thing when, when the Ukraine wanted to join the, um, or, or do an EU association agreement. He thought he had been, was able to uh, bribe Yanukovych to, to do it otherwise. And then it blew up in his face. And since then, all of these tactical, tactical moves haven't been strategic. They've been tactical. And, and it hasn't worked out well for him. Um, and, but, but what he is doing is he's bluffing like hell. And at the moment, we're folding on every hand because even though he's got a pair of twos and we have a full house, we don't seem to understand that we have a full house. Yes, but we have more nuclear weapons than he does uh, as the West and better ones. No, I mean, if you're talking about bluff and counter bluff, we can do that. The other thing which makes Putin extremely vulnerable and behave like he does behave is that he's basically... Um, through every um, political adversary in prison uh, made sure he took away the money of everyone who was rich and wasn't his friends which means that he's pretty sure what his fate will be once he leaves office 
he has no way to leave office like anyone has in the West. He has to stick in the office. So he has to f see whether Medvedev is his new poll next time he needs to vacate his present office or whether he has to find someone new. That will be his weak spot because then he has to trust someone and he's not 100% in control at that point. Okay. Peter Omzicht, thank you very much. Bill Browder, thank you for... Thank you for writing... Thank you for writing this book. And because of you, we will never forget a very brave and loyal man, Sergei Bagnitsky. Thank you. Thank you also, <coughs> excuse me, thank you also on my behalf <coughs> for um, your bravery, for your uh, being with us this evening. Thank you, Peter Omzig and Michel Krielaars. <coughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I want to point out to you that on March 12th, we have an event at 4 o'clock in the afternoon with Anthony. <coughs> if it sounds to you like I have my head in a fishbowl, it sounds even worse inside. <laughs> Our upcoming speakers, March 12th, Anthony Townsend, the rising star of the Smart City Movement. Uh, on April 7th, Anthony Doerr, about his beautiful book, All the Light We Cannot See, great talent of the up-and-coming future. And on April 16th or 17th, George Packer of The New Yorker, and a fantastic book called uh, The Unwinding of America. And Chris Keine will be our moderator for that event. So thank you for joining us. Hope to see you again and bring a friend. <laughs>